Oh, to Laura Carmichael and Hugh Bonneville. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, we've done quite a few of these events celebrating Downton Abbey at the Apple Store with uh, special Apple um, iTunes events. But this, is, this will be the last one, certainly in London. And I guess you're kind of winding up the whole experience that's been a huge part of your lives for the last six or seven years. How does it feel right now? Well, we're going on a sort of world tour of Apple stores, really, yeah, just to, just to bring things to a close. <laughs> it, does feel, um, it does feel like the end. I mean, that trailer really, you know, when it first came out, we thought, well, that's, that really is final. Yeah. Um, so it's been, we've had a, a wonderful time over six years, and they've sort of flown by, but it's definitely the, the right time to quit while we're ahead. And how does it feel for you, Laura, like kind of when you're in the process, I guess, of saying a fairly long goodbye, but to this show? Yeah, this because show. we have every location that we wrapped on, we had a different party. So <laughs> right. I think we've, um, we've really milked it. But um, yeah, it's, it's really emotional. We were very emotional filming all of the last scenes and um, wrapping different characters. But it, it is nice that we have this time when it's airing and... It airs later in the States, so we'll do promotion later there as well. So we kind of still see each other. It won't be till next year when we suddenly feel yeah. bereft, probably. Well, in fact, the, um, the, you know, marking the final scenes that everyone shot has already started because, for various reasons, Elizabeth, uh, who plays Cora, uh, her final scene was in the episode that aired last week. Uh, one of the dining room scenes, and uh, when that when I saw that come up, I suddenly you know, remembered that that was one of the last scenes we actually shot, wasn't it? Oh, wow. On location. Um, so we're all ticking them off one by one now. Yeah. So as we speak right now, we should say, um, if, when people are listening to this, um, that we're about to see the final episode of the season, the final normal episode of, of the series, on, which is coming up on Sunday on ITV at 9 o'clock, and then there's the Christmas Day traditional so that's the absolute finale of that episode. But there's a kind of, having seen, I'm lucky enough to have seen the, the, uh, this Sunday's episode, and it does have a feeling of a lot of things happening. We're building up your character, for example. There's this, there's this uh, issue, or isn't she going to get married to this lovely man? How, how, is, how is she kind of feeling right now, how, kind of as we near the end of her story? Well, she's delighted, <laughs> I think. Um, she's very much in love with Bertie and wants to marry him, but... Um, She's worried about Marigold and yes. will she be allowed to live with them? Should she tell them the truth, etc.? How did it work with, with Julian Fellows, the writer of the whole thing? It struck me that um, watching that episode that goes on Sunday, that it feels like the whole thing has been building up to this like six years of episodes, it's been building up to I mean, what he's got in store for you all, I guess. But it definitely feels certainly for you that. This romance is like a... You really deserve to have some happiness and romance in your life, don't you? Oh, yeah, you I think people do want to see Edith married. Yeah. Um, happily. But, um, yeah, it's, it's nice that that has been this ongoing arc. Yeah, but don't forget, her nickname is Poor Edith. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. it's not going to be a smooth path, yeah. whichever way. <laughs> Absolutely, and I don't think... Um, yeah, he, he doesn't disappoint you. That's it. No, no. Did you, did you talk to him about, um, how much does he, do you communicate to him about what he has in store when, when things are wrapping up? Did you, did you, do you know? Uh, or I, did I, you read the script? Well, we read the first five came through in whatever it was, January or so, and there were a couple of things within, within my storyline that uh, I just commented about. Um, I think along with some of the nation, I was slightly confused about the hospital plot and uh, was wondering where it was yeah. going. And uh, I'm delighted to say it's still there in episode eight. Um, and, um, and also, I, you know, when I read, uh, the, the, well, for, the, for those, there's a spoiler for those who haven't seen uh, this series yet, but uh, what happened in episode five, with uh, Robert's illness. Yes. Um, when I read that, I had to read it twice because I thought it, I said this could be a great coup de telle because uh, I wasn't. I knew everyone saw that something was coming to Robert. And everyone was thinking maybe he's going to have a heart attack or be cut yeah. off the hospital in the final episode. And then so that was a wonderful shock. Um, yeah. And there's uh, there's some more to come actually. Let's talk about. We've got to talk about that scene because that is one of the most extraordinary scenes in history. <laughs> Not only of Downton Abbey, but British television. Uh, it's become known as the alien scene, I believe. Uh, yeah, that's how, we, that's how we referred to it. Yeah, too. so your, your ulcer burst and <laughs> literally blood. I mean, it was apt. And I was warned as, as, a, as a TV critic, you, you, you know, publicist, so there's a big thing coming up and you have to sign everything saying you're not going to give it away. But even then, I was stunned and shocked. So, 
How was the film? Was it fun filming in a way? It was. It was. It was we, we rehearsed it meticulously in a sort of aircraft hangar with sort of safety people around almost. Yeah. No, we, we rehearsed it at Ealing Studios a few weeks before, and the, the biggest concern was getting the, the uh, colour of the blood right. right, because we know that there are very keen followers of, uh, of Dan's and Abbey uh, uh, oddities and uh, any mistakes, so we had a doctor uh, you know, to go through it with us so that the first spout of blood is darker than the second, okay. because the first... When an ulcer bursts, it'll be, I hope none of you have eaten yet. Um, when an ulcer uh, you know, is burst, it, it pools blood in the stomach, and so that has a darker colour when it first comes out. But, it's, but from then on, it's pumping blood. So that, that is a richer red. And so the, uh, our makeup artist was uh, you know, playing with the different colour tones as we spattered it over, <laughs> over white cloths in, um, in Ealing Studios, uh, with lots of people taking photographs from different angles and working out how to do it most economically, because obviously, Resetting the dining table of the white cloth at Highclere takes you know 40 minutes. So in the end, uh, and also you know how to make it a good dramatic effect. And also my biggest concern was how much could I get on Elizabeth McGovern? Right. I mean, uh, it was very funny. <laughs> Poor Elizabeth McGovern. Yeah. Hugh really, really tried to cover Elizabeth, and none of us expected that he would get that far. But she was covered. Um, did you get spotted? No, no, I, I, I was safe. You were out of it. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. sort of to your right. I okay. Think. Famously in Alien, they didn't. I think they Ridley Scott the director, didn't tell the rest of the cast yeah. that John Hurt's some of us but you you were all told what was going to happen we were but yeah. we didn't know it was going to be as explosive as it was <laughs> no. I don't think so uh, it's still, we still are quite genuinely shocked <laughs> I think in the yeah this, this whole thing with this poor kid is just ruining her life but she's met this wonderful man the other thing of course is the lady this lady Mary battle yes I think it's safe to say is reaching mm -hmm. ahead a yeah. very interesting head how is that for you to act act to that with Michelle Dockery and how, how do you get on and is it fun that you've got you two yeah. of your kind of the war between the two of you is building up isn't it yeah we love it um, Michelle and I are very close friends so it's it's really fun to play those scenes where we are awful to one another it's quite fun um, and I think you know knowing it was the last series we wanted them to have a moment where they would say all the things they want to say or you know either clash or make up and I think as you can see through the previous episodes Mary is starting to get a bit suspicious about Marigold yes dangerous. Yeah, she's the only person in the world who doesn't know isn't she? yeah much. that's it and, yeah. and it's simply because she doesn't pay Edith enough attention I don't think she doesn't care enough um, but yeah that's sort of been bubbling away what really struck me is looking at that clip. The, yeah. the, when I talk about the costumes, um, yeah. particularly for the ladies, I think I think you know Anna's done an amazing job this year in pulling out even more. Every every scene that you girls seem to have another stunning outfit. I think it looks great. Well, then she thinks about where that we're going to be filming. So in that, you know, my blouse matches the meadow. It's sort of ridiculous, wow. but. Um, the, um, the dress that Mary wears in the Criterion matches the ceiling in the Criterion, and, you know, it's it, it's so thoughtful. Yeah. Well, I was going to mention that, because I think this series, it feels like as, as the show's going on, that it gets visually more lavish and more kind of beautiful. Does it, does it seem that, was that a deliberate thing? Was that a thing that maybe it was just more money? I don't know. How... I do think it's more money. It's certainly more, it's certainly more ambition, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there, is, there, is, there is more money on the screen. There's no question about that. And I think as the confidence grew, and you know, we've had three costume designers. Uh, one was sort of promoted from within. Uh, uh, and, then, and then Anna came over in the last, came on board in the last two seasons and she's stepped up a gear again, particularly, I think, you know, with the, obviously with the fashions changing as fast as they did in, the, in that period, for, for women particularly. Uh, and it does look more sumptuous. So it's stunning, I think. And in terms of the kind of the big themes, I guess, of this final series, it feels like um, Junior Phillips is definitely establishing clearly that this is a kind of a very important time for the whole aristocracy and having servants and that whole thing that is kind of winding down to a certain extent. You know, you had to have members of the public coming in um, to the house in all of this. That, was that, that, that's an interesting kind of thing to deal with, isn't it, for the show? Because a lot of people kind of think it's a celebration of, of you know, the absolute dances. But, but this is clearly showing that it's all a bit... 
stop getting a bit sad for everyone, really. Does it feel that way to you? It's certainly, uh, well, obviously the thing of opening the house, you know, and God forbid this should ever happen for real sort of right. thing, you know, is obviously a knowing wink at uh, what's ha what happens to most big houses these days just to keep functioning. Um, uh, High Clear being a prime example. But uh, I, I, think, I think Julian is very even-handed. Yes, he does celebrate this world uh, and, and clearly loves it, but he's not uh, shy of, uh, you know, pointing out his faults uh, and, uh, and that this is an end of an era. Mm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that was sort of Julian's intention with the show initially in the first stage direction was to kind of highlight how this was the beginning of the end for houses like this. So um, I think it's, it's obviously grown as we've gone along. Mm. There was a lovely scene in that episode where, where the public were coming in and, and you a little boy and you were ill in bed and the little boy wanders in randomly. I thought that, that was a great little moment. Wasn't really good? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So yeah. good. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that. It's one of my favourite scenes, actually, because, you know, this little out of the mouths of babes, yeah. you know, so why, why are you living in a big house like this? Why yeah. can't you live in a normal house, yeah. you know? And you think it's a fair point, you know, yeah. why do we live with yeah. all this? And it's just... You know, this sense of the great tradition of these big estates, these big houses um, coming to an end. And um, you know, I, think, I think it's really flagged up, especially in that first episode when we go over to Mallerton to see uh, Sir John Darnley's estate literally being sold off piecemeal. Oh. And that that is the way that so many of these estates ended up, you know, um, yeah. the family silver being sold. And do you think in terms of Robert's um, story that he's, he's, going, he's becoming, he's clearly becoming more, I think, thinking more about the staff and thinking more about his relationship with the servants all of that that's clear isn't it coming up especially as we reach the end of the series i think so yeah he's uh yeah he's, he's <clears throat> having to scale back a bit and uh, taking a long time to get rid of poor old uh, thomas <laughs> the under the under butler but um yeah he can see the writing on the wall he's always been slow to catch up but once he gets the point he does embrace he does embrace change yeah, yeah it's a relief to have a dog not called isis now a new dog <laughs> You want good tea, oh, yes. I'd like to put to bed any uh, any thought that uh, the dog met its demise because of its name. Um, that was not the case. As I'm sure the astute members of this particular audience know, television shows are written many months in advance of international events. And uh, in fact, it was like something I did suggest to, to Julian. I said, you know, like we're all you know not aging in the show very significantly, but this dog is now getting really should be getting really quite old, yeah. and that might be a fun storyline to you know not fun storyline, but it might be a storyline to <laughs> <laughs> might be a storyline to explore. And so he he, he went with that, and uh, we we lost poor Isis, but now we have lovely little Tio, who is very sweet. It's, it's he does seem a very cute. Dog. She 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 she's, she's, she's a bitch. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Um, and. Did you see um, Dame Maggie on the Graham Norman a couple of weeks ago? She was in tremendous yeah. form. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And what struck me about, I mean, she's not in this episode particularly, but she, she is, she's back in the, in the, in the series, which is probably off film, I imagine, or something like that. That's my guess. But, uh, uh, I can't remember what, what she, I think she wanted to lie down. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But I think she's got more and more, more feisty, more stronger, funnier, everything um, as the series has gone on. And now just has some extraordinary scenes in this final episode. Um, what's, your, what's your favourite experience of acting with Dame Maggie? I think the most memorable for me was my first because I was absolutely wetting my pants and uh, uh, it's the scene when she, uh, in episode one of the first series where she shields her, her hand against the lights with this new fangled thing called electricity which we've had put into the ground floor rooms and she says it's like being on stage at the Gaiety Theatre you know, and, uh, and in the stage direction it says she shields her, her face from the light for a moment but she brought out her fan and held it there for the entire scene. It was just brilliantly uh, comic and, and uh, just really set the tone for everything that she's done since. She's, you know, she's a legend. She's so quick. Her mind is quicksilver yeah. and she can, she can uh, sell a line like no one else. Yeah. Laura, what's your favourite memory? I don't know, really. I'm trying to think because they're all really great and I, she really makes me laugh and I really enjoy trying to make her laugh. And so um, that's sort of true of all of it really i got into a habit of um finding funny animal pictures on the internet and storing them to show to maggie because i showed her a cat picture once and she loved it and uh and so and when she got you know, a bit fed up she would say you know show me the cat and i get my phone out and find it so yeah i mean just too many happy memories really 
How long ago did you film the last your last scenes? Uh, I finished on August the tenth, so okay. was that a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago. And how did it feel? Well, did it did it was there a tear in your eye? Was what was the well, you and Michelle had a, a, a moment at Highclere, didn't you? When yeah. We finished in July in High, at Highclere. Yeah, yeah we, we walked through the house crying. OK. <laughs> um, then sat on the bench and cried. Um, yeah, it was really surreal, and that particularly saying goodbye to the house, because it instantly felt like someone else's home again, and it, it, for a, a while, for six years, it felt like our home or office or something and uh which is very clearly not that again yeah um, I, I did my last scene with michelle which was rather nice because it, i think i did my first scene with uh with her as well uh and so we had a nice little quartet scene and then um i was fine i was i thought oh that's it you know another job done and i got into the makeup chair and I started taking makeup off and i saw all the sort of picture references around the around the mirrors and all the sort of snapshots that have been taken over the course of this last series and I did have a little you know, <clears throat> dust in my eye for a moment. Good. Jim yeah. Carter, big old bluff Yorkshire yeah. Jim Carter, yeah. broke down in sobs. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So he was Jim, it was Jim the most emotional of all of you. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ranked the whole cast in terms of <laughs> Uh, no, he was. I think they, yeah. they were doing a, it. was a very nice scene to end on. I think they scheduled it purposely mm. that it was a, a group scene with, with the, from the downstairs, and it ended in quiz. The scene was quite emotional. And I yeah. think when uh, when Jim heard that's a rap and uh, that's a rap on X Y Z and A B and C from the cast, I think that's when it hit him. And he saw when he saw Bo Bobby the Grip. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a big, you know, burly, stocky Welshman in tears. That set Jim off. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you have the grip, it is. That's that's yeah. big. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our grips are always crying though. And I think oh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, they were grown men weeping. Yeah. So. Do you know if when when it came to um, when you read the final scripts and you read whatever was in store for your characters, what was your? I mean, I don't want you to give anything away, but what was your feeling? Honestly, I could. I have on my iPhone a. As the script was handed to me, it was a day at Highclere Castle, and I gave uh, one of the ADs my phone. I said, right, film me, because I'm now going to turn to the last page. Yeah. And because uh, I wanted to know, you know, what happened. I, I read the last scene. And uh, it, it's, it's quite... It, well, I'm not going to say anything, but uh, <laughs> my reaction was appropriate to uh, the result. Interesting. And you, and Lauren? Um, yeah, I can't even remember. It was sort of... Um, it, it, it felt very significant and I think it ends really beautifully I think Julian does a really great job and I think as this series has gone on I think it heats up and it leads to a big explosion in a way that I think people will feel satisfied or I hope you know mm. it's been a, a big thing and, but as always you know as Julian's always reflected on in, in, in each series each episode really that some stories in life are never finished, or are left unfinished, or are better left unfinished. Sure. So, sure. Uh, uh, but I, I, I certainly choked up when I did sit down and read it properly. I, I certainly choked up as much because I knew this was the last time I'd be reading. They've always been such a pleasure to read, uh, as much as anything. And uh, this was the, my last experience of ever reading one of these, and there've yeah. been fifty-two of them, which I know by American standards is nothing, but uh, but uh, it's been a you know fifty-two episodes of our of our lives. Did you did you do you know whether he had his plan for the ending of the of the series in mind? You know, for a long time, or do you know? Did you speak to him about that? Or do you... well, we as, as some people probably know, we we were due to finish after series five, yeah. and it was during that. What was it? The end of series four? I can't remember. Anyway, at some point, yeah, he he actually said, "I don't think I can bring this into land in a way that would satisfy me and the audience." It was feel too rushed, and so we all, that's why we agreed to, to do a six. So rather than you know people saying the show's being cancelled, actually it was extended, and um, uh, you know we so it gave him time to breathe right. and, and let 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 him play with the characters' futures in the way that he felt best. Mm. And do you do you ever talk to him, Laura, about you know the way your the arc of of, uh, of your character, or, or do you let him kind of do what he wants and then? You, you act it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely tried at points and <laughs> yes. failed. Um, so I gave up after a while. But um, it, he always comes up with, you know, wonderful storylines and you know he's going to lead it in an exciting way. And um, so I, there's not much I would have really wanted to change ever. Sure. And lately this has become a good bit of a kind of feminist um, kind of icon. Yeah. I'm used to all icon. I've just... Just mentioned, but sure. in the series with the news, with the magazine, and you yeah. know, it's kind of that. I never expected that to happen, really. And no. I think he does. 
I think, think people don't necessarily give him credit, but he explores these things, racism, homosexuality, feminism, it's all there, isn't it, these, these themes that he explores. Yeah, well, and I think it's such a fascinating time for women, you know, the 10 years that we've spanned, more than that, 13 years. And, um, yeah, so I think it, it, that's going to be reflected in the female characters, but, yeah, I think it's, it's fascinating what's happened to Edith. Um, but, you know, she would have been the most traditional. I think she would have been very happy to marry a lord mm. in Caesar in one. But um, it was not to be, and that sort of has led her to be more interesting, which I've loved. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, she's got more and more kind of interesting as it's gone, yeah. hasn't she? Yeah. And what's it been like being a daughter of, of Hugh over oh. these years? <laughs> Uh, it's been lovely. It's been really lovely. We do feel like family is funny. Yeah. Um, you know, and Elizabeth as well, you know. We are very close and I've, I've loved it. Oh. And, and, and since we're nearing the end, I'm going to ask you a couple of things. Like, so what's been your, what's your favourite memory of the whole, the whole filming period, of the whole six years? Can you think of a scene or a, a storyline that strikes you? Yeah. I don't know why, but I've I've loved when we filmed in Annick for some reason. I've, you know, I've, uh, the, the atmosphere up in Annick Castle was astonishing. We go there again in the uh, Christmas episode. Um, not only the, the the welcome we got there, but just the atmosphere of the place, and also because it meant that we were all together, um, you know, on, on tour, so to speak. And the people of Annick were incredibly welcoming. Um, and in terms of specific scenes. Um, well, actually, I do remember, I mean, it was a, a soggy memory. It was when we were shooting the grouse last year and we literally went from hail in the morning to sort of bright sunshine to deep, dense fog to mist to rain all in one day. And we thought, I remember thinking, we'll never be able to cut, they'll never cut this together. Yeah. And of course, you watch it and it looks absolutely fine. But that was it. I've got, <laughs> again, memories of everyone huddled under umbrellas with the, with the sort of wool, tweed and wool coats mm -hmm. absolutely black with rain on them. That was memorable, probably for the wrong reasons. But um, yeah. what about you? I think maybe the the garden party in season one, just because there was something that happened by that point in filming. You know, we were on our eighth episode, and we could kind of feel that it was probably going to be quite good, or that it would be okay. You know, it was going quite well, and we really, you know, were getting on very well. And it was a sunny day, and a great scene. And uh, I think we were excited with what we'd done. So I've got very happy memories of, of that day. And we shot, yeah, in fact, we shot, that was three days, wasn't it? That whole yeah. sequence of the garden party when war is announced at the end of uh, season one. And uh, we were blessed. In fact, we've been blessed so often by the weather. I mean, we had to pr postpone the cricket match in season three, three times because of rain. And because it was a three day sequence. And it literally, it was raining. The rain stopped just as we started filming, and the rain started just as we finished day three. Um, and, this, and similarly, with the, uh, with the garden party in season one, we had three, three days of beautiful weather. Not too, you know, too sun-drenched, which of course is not, isn't great for filming, but, but with a, a consistent light, and, and it had that pre-war, you know, when everything was golden and perfect, and then this news came, and uh, everything was going to change. And of course, none of us knew that we were going to do a second series, so... No. <laughs> Yeah, um, they had a finality about it. And at what point, and it has become a cultural phenomenon, not only in this country, but in America, a particularly extraordinary response over there. At what point did you kind of realise this is really something huge and, and you know, that I guess it's kind of changed your life in a way? I don't know, because it, it just continues to surprise me in Snowball. Yeah. Um, I remember Sophie uh, McShira, who plays Daisy, telling me that Joan Rivers had tweeted about it. That was quite early on in the first airing of, of season one so um that felt really exciting and you thought oh gosh people might watch it over there and but that's really how yeah. um you know we felt about it so i don't know when we realized how big of a deal it was. i think it, i think i think well a when when the when the the figures went up for episode two which rarely happens mm -hmm. because Normally, you know, the, the publicity may, means you get a certain audience for the first episode, and then those who like it stay, and uh, those who don't, it normally drops off by, I don't know, 20% as an average, I guess. Ours went up by 10 or 15%, and then it grew and grew and grew. So that started being a bit interesting. And then I, it was really when a, when a lad came up to me in my boy's playground at school, uh, and he was about 10 at the time, and um, this is this particular boy, and uh, he said, I don't like that, Thomas. And I thought, <laughs> and, and um, I thought, you're 10. 
and you're watching Downton. And then gradually you start to realize that the demographic for the show is extraordinarily broad. Um, it wasn't just your, your normal, if you like, Sunday night costume drama audience. It had spread to teenagers and, and, young, and young kids and that families were watching it together. And that's, that's one of the consistent things that people have said that they can watch it as a family, apart from maybe one or two scenes. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah. um, but, but it has brought, you know, grannies and grandchildren and, and uh, you know, uh, children together. Absolutely. And when you're in America, you get fated by politicians and all sorts. Who, who are your favourite celebrity fans of the show? You, you've been to the White House. That's a, yes, that's the, the First thing. Lady's a, a big fan. And when we were there, actually, it was John Kerry, who's now Secretary of State. He, yeah. um, he came over to, 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 to say hello to um, Elizabeth and myself. And uh, he said that he'd had, uh, he'd had some, he hadn't been sleeping well uh, a few weeks before. And so he'd, he'd sort of stuck on this DVD at about three in the morning that his wife had you know, been watching, which he hadn't taken any notice of. And he said, I was still there at 10 a.m. <laughs> I was hooked, and uh, so that's quite strange when you see uh, people like that getting uh, involved in it. That's pretty good. Yeah, and I think being part of, like, going over the awards stuff has been mm. super fun because you do meet the cast of Mad Men and the cast of Game of Thrones, and, you know, so you do end up sort of meeting them, and that's been amazing to be considered in amongst their, yeah. Yeah. their dramas. So yeah. that's been really lovely. Yeah, because you and your aunt have been nominated for Golden Globes and Emmys and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to throw it open to the audience. We've got time for questions. Before I do, my final question there's always rumours of a film. Is that, can you give us an exclusive? Any news on that? Uh, absolutely no idea. Um, uh, genuinely. I think. I think we're all ready just to, you know, to, to celebrate the end of it. And if in time Julian uh, puts his pen to paper and comes up with a script that, the, the, as he said himself, the delicate thing is, is you, it can't just be another episode because yeah. then it's not cinematic. And if it's too cinematic, then people say, well, where's Downton Abbey gone? So it's a very t t tough tightrope to walk. And if anyone can put it off, it's the Oscar-winning yes. writer of Gosford Park. So well, he could always write Gosford Park again. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Just do Gosford Park too. Yeah. 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 Well, well. Yeah, we'll would see you be up for it if there was a film? I'm yeah, up, but, yeah. I mean, it would be really interesting in terms of uh, of when he's able to do it. Mm. He's so busy, Julian. He's got yeah. five new shows starting. He's doing a play on Broadway and all sorts. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see, but I'm sure you'll love to get back together and... And yeah. Before one more thing, you've got your your film Burn Burn Burn, which got nominated for a British Independent Film Award this yes, week. Yes, it did. Which is very Thank exciting. you very much. Yes, and what can you tell us about that film? It looks looks fascinating. It looks very exciting. It's great fun. It was really nice to do something very different. It's a comedy. It's a road movie. Um, two girls are scattering the ashes of their dead friend, um, but it is a comedy, and they um, sort of yeah meet some odd and interesting British characters along the way. Um, but uh, yeah, I loved it and I'm, I'm very proud of it, so I'm excited about the Biffa novel. Yeah. It's great. And you, you played Lord Mountbatten in the film coming up. Yeah, yeah, from one Earl to a Viscount. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I've just finished a film in, in India directed by Gurinder Chada, who made uh, Bender Light Beckham, uh, called Viceroy's House, and it's about the final days of uh, British India. Um, and it's in, in structure, it's not unlike uh, Downton in that you know, the, the, there's the political front cloth going on upstairs with Nehru and Gandhi and Jinnah and the whole political machinations that were happening. But the, the real heart of the story is what's happening in the kitchens and backstage as, uh, you know, as between the servants. And of course, as, as the tensions build and, the, and, the, and the, the, the country begins to fracture, so does the, the house, the, the staff. And so Gillian Anderson and I play... Uh, Lord and Lady Mountbatten. Yeah. Wow, that's very exciting. Right, right. let's start with the So we've got mics. So if you put your hand up, if you have a question, and we'll get a mic to you. Hello. Uh, it's a two-part question, I guess. Um, what aspect of uh, the 1920s, particularly aristocratic lifestyle, would you like to incorporate into your life, if you would? And then conversely, what part of modern life are you particularly thankful for in comparison? Um... I, I would like hats to come back. I think hats, particularly on men. I don't understand why, what happened. Um, I think those are lovely. And uh, my grandpa always used to wear hats, so I, I like people to start wearing hats again. Um, but then what, what, what would I not like? I mean, I guess I love, you know, the modern, the freedoms that we have today and that it isn't a strange thing for a woman to own a newspaper. Um, so, I, yeah, I feel very... Um, 
pleased to have been born in this time, despite there being less hats. <laughs> Um, I'm with you on the hats. I think you were rocking it earlier. I, think. I am. Yeah. Fact, I'm, I'm bringing it back, Laura. It's all down to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I I think I like I like the pace of life. Um, the, the fact that you can't be got in touch with so instantly and immediately. I, I think. Um, even though Edith does seem to go up and down to London, um, you know, faster than an intercity train, um, <laughs> uh, I do like that. I do like that sense that you can't quite be got at as easily as you as we can now all connect. Um, and of course, we're in the, in the you know here we're sitting in the hub of connectivity. So I would uh, I would I would uh, I would not miss uh, the, the technology that we now have um, and the solitude. And there was one day actually you were asking about favourite moments. There was one day in series one when, after the ash cloud had had, had been had been in uh, in Iceland, wasn't it? And um, and so there was no there was no fly zone for whatever two or three weeks, two weeks or so. And then, so the sky was absolutely clear. And Maggie and I were out on the lawn doing a scene, and she said, "This is what it would have been like, of course." And you realise then how much of our lives is taken up with background white noise or, or white images of, of vapor trails and everything else. So I think that just that sense of uh, simplicity, but. Um, but that's crazy also because we, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to live in the world uh, with all the technological advances that we have. Um, so uh, I wouldn't like to live in those times, but I, but it's, it's, I like to spend a Sunday night there. <laughs> As we all do. Yes, who's next? Oh yes, just there, towards the back. Where did you, where did you film in London? Specifically, and um, how did you enjoy filming in London as opposed to Highclere? Well, it's it's nice to be in London because I I live in London, so it's <laughs> nice for me. Um, and it's very exciting when you're filming here because they close roads. We film at odd hours um, of the night often, um, and yeah, we've shot in a couple of places. Uh, we shot in Rules, not very far, in fact, just on Maiden Lane. Go there, it's very nice. Which is one of the oldest restaurants in London, I think, um, and has remained the same. It's also in James Bond, I saw the other day. Um, and The Criterion um, by Piccadilly, uh, which is another beautiful restaurant. And where else have we been? Well, we, we filmed in, I can't remember the name of the house, but it's, it, it doubled as the Buckingham Palace, and it's... Um, it's at the end of uh, Pall Mall, uh, when, if you... If you oh, the IOD. Uh, but, but, um, it's, it, we, it's just before you turn up, um, gosh, St. James's Street, I think it is. Anyway, if you carry on there, there's a, there's a whole little world down the end of uh, Pall Mall. Um, and in there is this particular building, which I think was the same architect as Buckingham Palace, with these you know, palatial rooms. I um, can't remember the name of the house now. But, um, so that was rather stunning to film in when, uh, in the Christmas special of season four, when Lady Rose was presented to the king. Um, so that was rather magnificent. Um, where else have we filmed on there the street? There's some more that I'm not going to tell you because they're to come so in the oh, next yes. few episodes. Um, but yeah, it, it's really exciting filming in the capital and you get you know crowds of people wondering what's going on. Oh, we did St Pancras as well. That was very clever um, mm. because I, I was wondering how on earth are they going to do this? There's the Eurostar there. But they, they put up a bit of fake wall here and a, you know, a prop fence there and they magicked it. But we come out, um, Edith got off the train and was met by Gregson and they walk out and get into a cab. So it's very impressive. That's right. That. Thank you. Is there a lesson that your character learned in the series that you keep with you personally? <laughs> but a good question, you stumped them. Yeah. I think, I mean, Edith is sort of, um, she's very brave despite all of the knocks. Um, you know, the day after being jilted, there's that moment where she says, you know, I, I'm going to get up for breakfast. And Julian always says that about her, that she is resilient and she wants something for her life and she'll, you know, she'll pursue it despite the knocks. So I guess that's quite a nice thing to remember. I think, uh, well, two things really, I suppose. One is that the women are always right, <laughs> um, or it's easier just to play life that way. Um, uh, but also I think the thing I've always liked about Robert is that for all his uh, errors and, and mistakes and uh, misjudgments, he's got um, a, great a great sense of compassion. 
and tolerance. Uh, and I think that is something worth hanging on to. What is the worst mishap or disaster that's happened on set? Well, actually, okay. <laughs> there, with the, the, the new puppy, Tio, there's a, 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 a time jump in one of the uh, episodes coming up. And it's a, I can't remember, it's a few months. Um, so we had, obviously, you had to have two different puppies. Um, unfortunately, the animal trainer hadn't got quite the right message. And this, what looked to me like two-year-old dog turned up. It's meant to be go from three months to whatever, six or seven months. And um, unfortunately, we, we were stuck. We had, to, we had to film with it because, you know, there was only one dog in the van. Um, <laughs> but uh, so we did have to then go and re shoot a pickup shot um, and insert it into the scene a bit later with the, with the right size puppy. That was a bit of a mistake. It was a... Were you there that dog? I can't no, well, I, I witnessed the dog being shot on green screen. Yes. I think you witnessed the dog being yeah. shot there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's going too, too big. We'll just have to know. Not at all. Um, that wasn't very good. There was, I do remember Asparagus Gate, which was my fault in series one, um, where we were about to, we were going to shoot a scene with eating asparagus. And I suddenly got nervous about, because, you know, obviously you use your fingers and these days. And I thought, what, what if it was different then? And it was the one day that our wonderful historical advisor, the Oracle, Alistair Bruce, wasn't there. So we were trying to phone him. And he was up in a sky helicopter, you know, commentating on some royal thing, I think. And we couldn't reach him. So, so uh, I, I, it, as it turns out, the etiquette was you did use your fingers, but I, you know, I wasn't convinced, and so we ended up chopping all the asparagus up and pretending it was, they were beans instead. <laughs> yeah, um, and obviously Hugh and I uh, had the water bottle. Yes, uh, yes. water bottle date, yeah. Yeah, yes. so, and that, I mean, it, it wasn't as much of a disaster as it turned into, but um, it would have been cropped, that photo, to not include the water bottle. That was the plan. Yeah. Um, Sorry to sit through. But it good came out through. of it because uh, yeah. I'm now an ambassador for Water Aid uh, on the back oh, yeah? of that. And I've just been, yeah, when I was out in India, I went and saw a couple of Water Aid projects and uh, we're launching a, a, a campaign next week. So, you know. Wasn't that big a mistake? Did that really come off the water? Yeah, because really really yeah. yeah, well, yeah, as, as many of you will know, yeah, there was this water bottle on a shot of me and Laura in the in the, uh, in the drawing room, and um, so that sort of went viral. And it happened. It so happened that it was published on the day that we were all doing press conferences. So we were all together. So the next day, we you know we all got a water bottle and said donate to water aid, um, and then they got in touch and said, would I um, work with them? So it's been that's oh, been great. That's great. Right. Well, all I can do is thank you all very much for coming and thanks for your great questions. And thanks to Laura Carmichael and you, Bonneville.